a 70 millimeter. Isn't that amazing? I'm James Mathers. Uh, I run a group called the Digital Cinema Society. And you might think it's odd you know, that uh, the Digital Cinema Society would be celebrating uh, film, but uh, couldn't be more happy to do it. Uh, we've never been about uh, advocating uh, digital over film. It's just about finding the right tool for the job, helping uh, filmmakers keep up with the technology. It's just changing so fast, it's really, really difficult for everyone. And uh, um, our guest uh, you know, couldn't personify that more using the right tool. We're so fortunate to have an uh, esteemed cinematographer uh, of this film, uh, Robert Richardson, ASC. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of you already know. Three-time Academy Award winner for Hugo, The Aviator, and JFK, and such a long, long list of other notable films. Django Unchained, Inglorious Bastard, Snow Falling on Cedars, Born on the Fourth of July, Platoon, Kill Bill, one and two, Casino, The Doors, Natural Born Killers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can't see a film, though, and just by looking at it, know that, you know, oh, Robert Richardson must have shot that, because each one is unique. And um, he also chooses the best tools for every job. On JFK, he shot everything from 8 millimeter to uh, anamorphic, 35. For Hugo, he was one of the first to use the Area Alexa and in 3D, and he won an Oscar for it. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, Robert Richardson, ASC. Thank you. Uh, I know you went to AFI, but uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how you broke into the business and it's all amazing directors you've worked with? And tell us a little bit about your career. Uh, I started at Rhode Island School of Design, actually University of Vermont. I studied film, then I went to Rhode Island School of Design, got my bachelor's, and then followed up with my uh, master's at uh, AFI. And what was your first movie job? I did a uh, little work on Repo Man with Alex Cox. Uh, I did a little bit of a pickup work for Nightmare on Elm Street. A few films of somebody like that, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> Real small pieces, but I was working. And uh, I did documentaries. And when did you make the, the transition to DP? Well, I started, uh, I, all those little pieces I was doing DP war, uh, second unit work on, uh, I tried one film called Reborn as a camera assistant, and uh, I'll never go back. <laughs> <laughs> they basically couldn't fire me, I was so cheap. So I stayed on. Uh, then I worked on a film in El Salvador, a documentary about uh, the, the death squads, and shot for the right wing, and then ended up the left wing crew got uh, caught, and they were fled the country, so I shot the left side. And that's when you first got uh, with, together with um, uh, Oliver Stone. Oliver, uh, yes, that's when Oliver basically hired me so shortly after that to shoot the film Salvador, which is my first film. I'm a great one it was. And it wasn't too long before he hired you for JFK. No, actually, the next one was Platoon right away. Yeah, right. It was directly born following. Born the 4th of July. And Born the 4th. Uh, I worked with John Sales a few times in between. Uh, and uh, Errol Morris and uh, Rob Reiner. And then, uh, yeah, JFK. And Martin Scorsese? And Martin Scorsese, of course. No slouch. <laughs> no slouch there. And Quentin Tarantino. Uh, so tell us about what it's like working with uh, Quentin. Well, if Quinn were here, I probably would say this, but he's, he's a master. He's an unbelievable fire of creativity and energy. He's extraordinarily brilliant, as you all know, in terms of his knowledge of film. Uh, he and Marty are very similar in that way. I would, you know, I would give the edge to Quinn in terms of his knowledge. He's fabulous because he forces you to go to the next level. He's, he's, there is nobody better, in my opinion, in terms of what I've worked with, in terms of directing. He stays on the set all the time. He's right beside you. He stands and watches the actors. There are, there's no video village. There's a small monitor on camera. He'll stand by the camera and look at that monitor. 
but there is no video village. No one sees anything. Even in major stunts, we don't record. Like when we blew up the building in, in uh, Django, there was just two cameras. I had one and he had one, and we had exactly the same shot just in case one of the cameras broke. Wow. So let's get to The Hateful Eight. Marvelous, marvelous movie. Um, Ultra Panavision. It had been dormant for almost 50 years. Hadn't been used since the 60s. There was only 10 movies ever made, uh, including Ben-Hur and Mutiny on the Bounty. What got you guys uh, interested in resurrecting this format? Well, that was actually a, a, I took a wrong turn. I had the area, uh, we were going to shoot in, in 65 millimeter, but we were told that the uh, ultra panavision lenses weren't in existence or not capable of shooting with. So I was with Dan Sasaki looking at the lenses we did set up, and while he was setting up the lens, I walked through a curtain with Gregor Tavener, who was a camera assistant, and uh, on a wall in the back on some shelves were these very funky looking lenses. And I said, what are these, Gregor? Gregor goes, well, that's ultra Panavision. I said, I thought there weren't any. And there were quite a few of them. So they never throw anything away, do they? <laughs> they don't throw it away. And Dan Sasaki walked back, and he had ear to ear grin. He was inside, <laughs> like, oh my god. He said, what are these, Dan? Do they work? He said, well, we haven't put them up in a long time. He said, can you put one up? So we put one up. And I looked at it on the, on, on the framing charts, and it was just absolutely gorgeous. And I said, can we use these? Can we get enough lenses to make this? He said, I don't know whether we can. I said, don't tell Bob Harvey my thoughts. Okay, I don't Bob want anybody. Bob Harvey might be here by now, by the way. Bob Harvey, if you're here. So, <laughs> secrets out. Secrets out. So I said, don't tell him. I want to have a meeting tomorrow, and we'll have a discussion about this. Well, I came into the room the following morning. Bob was there. Everyone was there in the room from Panavision. And they said before I sat down, we're 100% behind this. Wow. <laughs> it was like, there's no question, we're behind it. And Bob was absolutely like a key, key to getting it done. Man. Uh, it's amazing, the grain, the color. The, it just sort of draws you in, you know? I mean, yeah, and I don't know if you know, the lenses are, are quite distinct. Uh, some of them were prism lenses, so they had a very odd shape. Some were cylindrical, which current, is a current design of lenses. But uh, it was, it was uh, an absolute pleasure to work with them. Well, I know you tested extensively. Can you tell us a little bit about the testing? Well, the testing, I did testing on both for, both lenses, so I could see if it didn't, because I couldn't guarantee that, no one could guarantee we could get the ultra Panavision lenses ready. So I shot, I flew, we flew to Telluride and shot in many of the places we were thinking about shooting and uh, shot landscapes faces with both sets of lenses. And uh, after the first test, I don't think there was a question in, within Panavision or in my own heart, that that was the proper choice to go. But the safe route was to continue to uh, protect both until I knew, and I, did, I didn't tell Quentin that we had these lenses. Ah. <laughs> uh, until I got to a point where I felt, all right, I can, I can bring it up to him because I don't want to break his heart. And when I brought it up to him, I said, we have an opportunity here, but it may not happen to use Ultra Panavision. He goes, Cinerama? <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of sitting around, but that's another name. But yeah, that, that's the basic approach, 276. So we're going to go for it. And uh, Panavision put everything behind it and did a phenomenal job. And uh, you had needed assistance from other companies too, uh, Kodak. Kodak actually was sto they had stopped making, st that was the end of 65, when we came aboard. And uh, Lorette, who's here in the audience today, who represents Kodak, helped uh, to get them on board very early, and they started to build to make 65 for us. And Photochem? A lot, not like you had a lot of choice where to go, but no choice my favorite lab. The only lab to go to is uh, for film right now is Photochem, and they did an unbelievable job as well. Now, they've been doing enough 65 millimeter and for IMAX. For IMAX. So uh, it, it was, it, we were in capable hands. They did a fantastic job. Now, that's pretty fat film, 65 millimeter. And a thousand foot roll must go through the camera really quick. Yes, yeah, so you have nine minutes. And then what, what we had, though, is as you can tell by Quinn's dialogue, it goes on for a while. <laughs> and he wanted longer takes. So we tried to get a 2,000 foot magazine made and for Kodak to develop 2,000 foot loads. They went and built 2,000 foot loads for you. They, yeah. And magazines. 
Panavision made the magazines. Ma Panavision created a magazine for 2,000 feet. But we found the motor couldn't quite handle 2,000, so it ended up at 1,800 foot rolls. Yeah, and you did some high speed too. Yeah, we did, you saw the high speed, yeah. You did that was as fast speed. as you could crank it. As fast as the cameras go. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like working in the cold? That must have been quite well, a Well, that was, honestly, that was a challenge. Everything hang, hang in there? That was a challenge, but I, I, I give a great deal of credit again to Panavision, to Gregor Tavener at the AC. They created the capability of these machines to be able to withstand these very low temperatures. And sometimes in the mornings it would be 10 or 12 below zero. And uh, by midday it would change. It was a, it's been a dry season, as you all know, so, or that was a dry season. There wasn't a lot of snow. We were there primarily to do the exterior work. An original plan was to stay there and only shoot one half of the haberdashery. And that was a haberdashery facing out to the door. The other half was gonna be shot on a stage here. Bit by bit, it turned from one half into, okay, well, we're gonna uh, include Joe Gage's corner. All right, we're gonna keep the kitchen in now. All right, kitchen's sticking, but we'll leave, we won't put it in the fireplace. Once I heard the fireplace was coming in, I knew basically I was shooting on a practical set. So half of them, or a percentage of it, is shot on location in a practical set with no removable walls. And where is that? That was in Telluride. Okay. And then you came back and built matching sets on stage? The same building was built here on uh, the red stages. But how did you get the, their breadth to show? And Quinton had a fleet of air conditioners. Oh, to make the stage <laughs> outside. <laughs> it was colder on stage than it was on location. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, it was so moist, too, because to get the breath, you have to be at the right dew point. So it was, it was it was nasty. We were all trying to hide the air conditioners. It was like, take that tube out of here. <laughs> like we, like, even actors were begging to shut it off. And some people sabotaged. <laughs> there were people pulling them, putting holes in them. It was just that cold. It was miserable, miserable. And you've got blankets on the camera to keep those warm. They had heated and they cold had, in there. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot of work. <laughs> Uh, how about visual effects? Were there a lot of visual effects in the movie? The visual effects in the movie are for the windows, when we were on stage primarily. But in the Quentin stage, Quentin was that a cutaway? Uh, what, excuse me? The stage, uh, the stage yeah. coach? It was sliced. Okay. You do it from one side, or you could go the other side, you could pull out the panels. But it was all shot practically on location with a, a camera car, essentially, and towing it. Okay, so you're backed up on the camera car. Driving down the road. Driving down the road. In the middle of Tyler, right? <laughs> I know you like to move the camera. At least you did with Scorsese. He loves to move the camera. Uh, but there's no putting that camera on steady cam. No. It, actually, we probably could have, but I think it would have maxed out the very edge of it. You would have had to go with a small load and, and an MOS camera. And um, no handheld, or at least not very practical. Not, not for me. I also broke my back on the show, so. Seriously? Yeah, yeah I was skiing uh, oh. with a friend. And, she did it. But. So how did you support the camera? Because uh, there was movement in it. Right? Yeah, no, it's quite a bit. We did a lot of crane work. Uh, I've fallen in love with the crane. Um, I like to ride. I don't necessarily want it on a technical crane unless a technical crane or a remote head is going to in some way enhance it in a way that uh, I can't achieve if I'm riding. I prefer to look through a lens at somebody. I it's organic. Know. Okay, and now I look at a monitor. Even though with digital, you know, you're looking at a monitor in your eyepiece. A lot of the guys that I start working with, because the show I'm working with now is called Live by Night, and we're shooting with the Area 65. Oh. With Panavision lenses, uh, vintage Panavision. They did a nice job working that out. Well, that's an interesting comparison that only you can make, having shot both those formats. Um, how much did the camera weigh, do you remember? Oh, I think they closed in on 90. With Film loads? No, that's not so bad. I thought it was worse. I think it's around that. Um, I might be wrong, though. Don't quote me. Very, very wide frame, that format. Two, seven, six to one? Yes. Well, it's obviously great for the panoramic scenes, but what do you think? Uh, how did you adapt it to shooting narrative well, dialogue scenes? You saw it. I, I love the fact that you can see so many characters in a scene. Um, they're almost always there. There's eight characters. They're virtually always visible. Even in a medium shot, you have the sense of who's somewhere else in the room. So you don't lose that. And that's what I, I, I felt. That's why I felt it worked quite well. I mean, Quentin is the reason we made 276 and why we should. It was his desire. And I'm not the type of DP that would say, 
I'm not going to do that. Not only did I, would I not say that, I look so forward to actually shooting 65 millimeter because I think it's a once in a lifetime. This film was also not, uh, it was chemically finished. In other words, there's not a, it's not scanned and put back onto film. Negative was cut? Negative was cut. It was edited on a flatbed. Uh, they did have Avid, but they did a lot of work on the, uh, and so it's all, chem I, I don't know how many of you that are younger do uh, have, have done a film. Uh, it's, a, it's a laborious process. You know, it's like you call out a point of density, two points of density, a little yellow. It isn't like you can go in and circle somebody and, oh, I'm gonna make him a little bit brighter, gonna make that wall a little darker. You're forced to be able to do it on, you have to do it on set. So it's essentially what you see in camera is what you've got here. I noticed um, that the white format was really well used one time when you had a close up of two people. It was a two shot, two shot, a, two shot close up, yeah. and they're both doing interesting things, you know. And you're yeah. watching back and forth, and they weren't relating to each other, but yes. there was a lot going on. And then I saw another time where it seemed like it was hard to get the person that wasn't supposed to be the center of attention out of the frame. That must have been a little hard too. Those were both in the stagecoach. Yeah, that's a true statement. Yeah, <laughs> you were. That was your battle then, huh? No, my battle. That battle was, was how to light. Ah. Tell me about that. Yeah, it's very different. It had a low ceiling. It had those wooden wooden tops. So when you have a lens that shoots a medium shot, like, and they had odd numbers. You have to understand the prism lens was a 57 millimeter, not a 50. And the close-up, my favorite close-up lens was 102. Yeah. I don't know how they figured that number out, but that's, <laughs> we call it 102 and a 57. And uh, But it's hard in any of those shots to keep lights out. It's equivalent, you know, it's, it'd be like shooting the whole film as uh, some have, you know, with a 14 millimeter. Well, we're all really lucky today to have seen the first, uh, one of the first showings of the roadshow version of uh, the film. Um, the masses will see it digitally projected. Uh, tell us about the roadshow concept. Well, that's a Quentin. He wanted to make it a, he wants to bring attention to the fact that clearly we're shooting on film, and film can be a great experience, unlike any that you have been given uh, the opportunity to experience thus far, which is why you have the, the prelude, but you also have an intermission. It, it, his thought is that you'll come in the theater, you'll have 70 millimeter, but you'll also have a booklet, and then that booklet will be notes about production, about cast, very similar to going to a play. Yeah, it was an experience rather than just going to a yeah, movie. Yeah, just not going to the film and sitting there. And I think the intermission is a very interesting concept because it allows you to walk and talk and sit and consider. And pee. And <laughs> that is Because well. it's a long movie, <laughs> but, but, but great. Um, how did you prepare for the road show? Did you have to color time the 70 millimeter different than the DCP? Uh, no, the 70 millimeter was done uh, in the lab at Photocam. It's, then once we graded it, it was, you know, it was, it's been printed and uh, IPs have been, IPIN have been also struck. Uh, then the uh, DCP was done. Uh, we did the road show as well in DCP, as well as what, what Quentin has referred to as the mall version, which is, is not gonna have the intermission or the prelude. A few things have been cut down. So the only true experience for his film is to see it in a theater in the 70 millimeter. They have cut down the number of theaters, I understand now, from 100 to 50. Uh, well, let me ask you about the dailies process. That must have been uh, challenging. Everything was done, uh, was delivered in uh, 70 millimeter. All the dailies were screened for Quentin on location in Telluride uh, for anyone in the crew who wanted to go. And all, all only select takes, clearly. And uh, which is something which is, that's disappearing too, select takes. The digital process with studios, like I'm working with uh, Warner Brothers, there are, no matter whether you have select takes or not, they're not done with select takes. Everything you shoot is delivered to you, bad or good. So for me, for us, we were able to watch 70 millimeter and judge it every day. And so that was allowing us to correct the look of the film. On a big screen? On, on a fairly, a decent screen. Beautiful. Um, can you tell us anything about your next project? Well, I'm working with Ben Affleck, uh, who's directing Live by Night. It's, uh, 
just gangster film uh, in the period of prohibition. And with the they, Alexis 65? And with the Alexis 65. Well, it's not, they call it the Aries 65, but yeah. Okay. And you're using the, um, the same, basically the same lenses? Or? No, we, are, we went with uh, cylindrical, uh, basically the uh, 220, uh, 2276. Um, do you have a wrist? <laughs> not enough, but I have a lot of women to feed. <laughs> Ex marriages, things like that. <laughs> What did I not ask you that no. you'd like to share that would be interesting for the audience? I don't know. I think you did pretty good here. <laughs> is there anything anybody wants to ask? Did he have a favorite shot is a question. Yeah, in terms of a favorite shot, I, I, I think it would be one of the one uh, close-ups of Sam Jackson. I, I really love his shots. And I also love the color, of the vivid color of the red on uh, which is in the bright yellow, but the, the, the way the blood ca is captured, for me, the 70 millimeter feels like a large version of Kodachrome. Just, I mean, saturated and full. No, no grain whatsoever, which is quite lovely. Um, it can be a little harsh, as I saw in a couple shots I haven't seen. I've seen it here before, I haven't seen it here before, I've seen it in DJ, but um, you can tell sometimes, oh, <laughs> same issue with digital. I think we all know that we, even worse. Well, actually, I'm getting better at it. Yeah. I'm learning some tricks. You want to share? <laughs> yeah, it's really lookup tables. Yeah. Look, I, I love working with lookup tables. So that, that to me is altering the perspective I have on why. Ben, ben and I did tests for 35 millimeter anamorphic, the Alexa, and the Aries 65. And after the test was done, we both came to the same conclusion. Let's, let's, let's go with the uh, Aries 65. And it's primarily because I could do so much with the lookup tables. Yeah, we saw uh, the great Panavision lenses. And the old Panavision lenses, which have a softer quality and a nice round off, which, is, which helps the digital aspect of, uh, of, of HD go away and give you a closer to film emulation. But I don't believe that we need to emulate with digital film. I think that digital is digital and we need to embrace what it is and learn how to make it its own voice. Like with Hugo, I tried no film emulations at all. We just created a look. Whether it looks like film or not, that's for somebody else to decide. But um, I'm, I, I tried, I'm trying not to get that look. Like just say, oh, I'm gonna go after film. I love film, I think it's the most beautiful. And we still have film. And so we still have it. We should hope to keep Use it. film when you can. <laughs> when you use, yeah. I would love to shoot every film. On, I would love to have shot this film I'm doing on 70 millimeter. I mean, 65, but. That was my, one of my last questions is, would you do it again? I would love to do it again. And would you recommend it to other people for projects? I would, if absolutely. it's right, if it's right, yeah. or. I think 65 is just, if you love the look of the grain, and you can get it projected. The big issue is projection. Because if you just, if you're gonna scan it, you're gonna scan it 6K because you've got to get that level of resolution. And when you get that level of resolution, you're in a different, you're going to have a different image on the screen. But I think it, format could easily work for anyone in any subject matter, in my opinion. I don't think it, I, this film could have been shot in 16 millimeter or 35 or 65. Quentin saw in his head this concept. And we made landscapes out of faces. Great script, great acting. Brilliant. Yeah. It's a wonderful, wonderful movie. Uh, and I love the, the Richardson shot. It, it'll be known as the Richardson shot from now on. You shoot like this, and the, they come up and <laughs> look under the brim of their hat. I think that's a Quint. You have a few of those. It, it, it's a real Quint. That's his, that's his thing. I have some thank yous, um, not the least of which is you, but we'll save you the best for last. I want to thank the Weinstein Company very, very much for allowing us to screen here. <laughs> and, uh, the American Cinematheque and the Egyptian theater. And I'd like to uh, especially thank our volunteer crew, uh, Alex Sachs uh, and Dwight Lay running cameras, uh, Christopher Nell keeping an eye on the sound. And sir, thank you so, so much. My pleasure. Thank you all for coming. Bravo.